Uh, my name is Rod Johnson. I'm uh, head of the Department of Animal Sciences. Um, I joined the faculty in 1993. Um, I went to undergrad at Truman State University. My goal was to become a farmer. Um, that didn't work out, so now I'm head of the Department of Animal Sciences at one of the, the top uh, programs in, in the world, if I might say so myself. Um, I want to just take a few moments to present a couple of PowerPoints um, to kind of set the stage for why uh, animal agriculture uh, is so important to be considered when we're thinking about innovation. It's an area that's ripe for innovation um, because we've got big problems um, that we have to tend to. Uh, this, of course, won't come to a, be a surprise to anyone in this room. You know, we're talking about uh, having to feed 10 billion people uh, by the year 2050. So this is the big challenge of our time. A couple of things about this schematic that I'll just highlight. You can see where the projected growth in population is expected to occur. And note that it's in developing parts of the world where oftentimes they lack the resources to produce the food uh, that they will need. The other part is, is listed up there at the top, and it's really kind of striking to consider the fact that the World Health Organization today estimates that only one-third of the world's population is well-fed, one-third is underfed, and one-third is starving. So two-thirds of the world's population is in a food insecure situation. So providing food for 10 billion people by 2050 is, is one of the big challenges that we're going to encounter. In my lifetime, population on this planet has already increased threefold. In animal sciences, it's not just the population growth that we have to consider. There's another big factor that's often left out of this, and it's the shifting demographics of the world population. With changing socioeconomic conditions in a variety of countries, including China as an example, there's more people than ever moving from poverty into the middle class. This is important for animal sciences because when people have more disposable income, they choose to spend their money differently when they're thinking about their diet. So they transition to consuming less grain and more protein of animal origin. So the demand for animal protein is expected to double in the next 30 to 40 to 50 years. And that's been referred to as the livestock revolution. And in this graph, you can see over this 23-year period of time, the increase in per capita consumption of animal protein versus the change in consumption of cereal grains. And you'll note that in the developing parts of the world, we're seeing a tremendous surge in the demand for protein of animal origin. So again, this is expected to double in the next 50 years. So we in animal sciences have to be involved in addressing this issue. Uh, we have to uh, be engaged in innovating and developing high-tech solutions that are going to allow farmers to feed the world. But it's not just produce, produce, produce. There are several things that have to be taken into consideration. Obviously, we have to make sure there's a sufficient supply of animal protein to address the changing dietary patterns. But we have to do so in a manner that's ecologically sustainable and socially acceptable. More than ever today, people care about how their food is produced, and this is especially true when we're talking about the production of animal protein. The product, of course, has to be safe and nutritious and healthful because people also recognize that what they eat affects their health. According to the CDC, the top ten, of the top 10 causes of mortality in the United States, six of them can be linked to diet. Okay, and so people understand that what they eat affects their health. So in our department, we talk often about moonshots. You know, what are the big things that we can do that would, if we were successful at achieving them, we would change the landscape of animal agriculture? And what I'm showing here is a famous quote from John F. Kennedy 
and I'll just paraphrase, he says that we're going to go, we're going to keep doing all of the things that are important to us, but we're also going to go to the moon in 10 years. And in the process of setting that goal and achieving it, there's going to be a lot of spin-off technology that benefits society. So my challenge to a lot of the, the innovators here is, is, you know, what's your moonshot? You know, what, are, what can't we do today that if you were able to solve that issue, it would change the landscape of animal agriculture in the future? In our department, we're working on a couple of different things that we think will be important for uh, addressing these issues. One is we're working to establish a, a joint degree with computer science, training students to work in the world of big data. We're also participating in a cluster hire on food insecurity in the College of ACES. Our position is in this precision animal management space, a very technological, technologically driven uh, position with the goal of optimizing production by reconciling the animal with its physical and social environment. So this is just one person's view of how that might occur. And you can see, I hope, the need for innovation to bring this type of uh, situation to reality. You can imagine a situation where you have objectives that relate to animal production, enhancing animal welfare, producing in an environmentally sustainable fashion. There's biometric data that needs to be collected. There's artificial intelligence that needs to be applied to enable real-time adjustments in the animal's environment or management to allow it to produce or have optimal animal welfare. So a lot of this technology is already starting to be introduced into the animal industry, but we are definitely at the beginning of the process, and I note that Last night at the reception, there were, I think, 15 i projects introduced, and only two of them related to animal science. So the opportunity is tremendous, uh, but we're at the beginning uh, of the process. So without further ado, I just want to introduce very quickly our panel. We have Angela Green, who is co-founder of Tell Tale. Angela is an associate professor in ag and biological engineering here at the University of Illinois. We have Lena Head, who is the site manager of Agco GSI, um, the office that is located here at the research park. We have Ryan Lane with us, who is vice president of animal nutrition and biotechnology research with Archer Daniel Midlands. And finally, we have Bruce Talion, who is with Elanco and is Director of External Innovation. And if I may, I would just like to kick off the discussion by asking each of our panelists to introduce their company and what it is doing in the animal space. So what's, what's your purpose in, in animal agriculture today? Hi. Um, is this on? Yeah. Maybe? Yes? No? No. <laughs> Try it now? Okay. <clears throat> I'll just talk really loud. So, Alanco Animal Health, we're uh, an animal pharmaceutical company. Um, and uh, uh, our origins began um, as a product from Eli Lilly. Uh -oh. I'm, getting, I'm getting the hook. <laughs> How do you like that? I'm an expert in technology. <laughs> <clears throat> Alanco Animal Health, pharmaceutical company. We uh, had our origins from Eli Lilly and Company. Um, th this week marks a, uh, a end of a journey for us as Eli Lilly extracts itself from the animal health business completely. We entered into an initial public offering in September of last year um, where Lilly put out 20% uh, of uh, Alanco onto the street, uh, and now they're getting rid of the rest of us, so um, to heck with them. Anyway, so we're a drug company. Uh, we sell drugs into a variety of different markets, uh, uh, the large animal, food animal uh, markets, uh, as well as the companion animal markets. 
Uh, and we look at, uh, we're platform agnostic, so large molecules, small molecules, vaccines, uh, probiotics, prebiotics, et cetera, uh, multiple different organisms, um, and um, lots of different channels to market. Um, and so we're always looking for ways to solve some of these problems uh, that, that were described, right? And, and find those innovative solutions, as well as the ones which are a little more straight, excuse me, straightforward. I'm Angela Green Miller, and I am president and co-founder of Telltale, uh, and I also wear a second hat as a faculty member at the University of Illinois in agricultural and biological engineering. Uh, Telltale, the startup, is focused on software solutions for uh, pig production management. Uh, we are very young. Uh, we're about a year old now, depends how you measure it, uh, but we are uh, an i national program baby. Uh, so we heard i mentioned several times today. We went through the national program about a year ago, uh, did some intensive customer discovery, uh, and that's kind of built the trajectory for where we're going. Uh, we met with a lot of different people in uh, the, the pig production industry, asking them, what's your pain point? Uh, and so we've landed with... Uh, uh, an initial product that we're working on related to uh, software solutions uh, focused on the top five pain points we heard, which are food, air, water, health, and weight for uh, producers. Uh, and the idea is that uh, I wanted to take some of the research approaches and research things that I was doing in my lab here on campus and make them accessible to producers. So I see there's a great divide between what we do in the research world and uh, what is actually accessible and available and, and uh, able to be used immediately by producers. And so we're trying to bridge some of that gap with um, our approaches in, in Telltale. I'm Lena Head. I am the site director for the Agco Acceleration Center here on campus. Um, as a part of Agco, I actually work for the GSI division of Agco, which is sometimes is still a well-kept secret. But within GSI, uh, we are a manufacturer of grain bins and uh, protein livestock equipment. Animal protein is what we call that division because that's largely what our equipment is being used for, is to produce animal protein. Um, I have been with our organization for six years, working on both sides of grain and livestock equipment um, in our business and also bring my own ag background. I grew up on a grain and livestock farm and currently um, help manage a commercial herd of 500 cows in central Illinois. But a large part of my role here in Research Park as our site director is um, helping to connect people like Angela that are doing research that's actually really relevant to us as an agricultural manufacturer to our organization and see where partnerships can potentially evolve from there. Good morning, everyone. Ryan Lane, ADM. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, small company down the road. We're focusing on solutions in, in feed, food, and industrial. Um, as the head of the animal nutrition and biotech, I mean, our main mission is to make sure that we're delivering consistent quality ingredients to producers, right? Identifying their unmet needs, and again, we're delivering those solutions. So, uh, a long, um, wide range of products ranging from amino acids, getting into protein concentrates. We're also getting into the animal health space with the pre and probiotics. But again, our mission is to make sure that we're nourishing animals and understanding the needs on a global basis. Okay, thank you. So I want to um, maybe just start with uh, a question for Lena. And, uh, you know, I talk about, in my presentation, the big challenge, you know, of, of feeding 10 billion people. How do you break that down into manageable pieces that a company like Agco GSI can tackle, you know, that will contribute, you know, to solving that problem? So from our perspective, we're, uh, what I would say is more on the really tactical level with growers. Our equipment is going in their farms, and it's something that they're using every day to feed and manage their operations. So part of growing um, the food supply is going to just be efficiency. So the more products we can create that are going to drive efficiency on their operations is better for the uh, overall industry. From our standpoint, you know, it really started with just making equipment that worked in a highly corrosive environment of animal agriculture. But it has really involved, uh, evolved to adding technology to those pieces of equipment. Where can we um, automate tasks that were typically done manually? And then 
we, as we automated tasks um, with our products on an individual basis, it rolled up to, now how can we automate these tasks into one single platform instead of having an individual controller for your uh, feed delivery system and an individual controller for your air system and all of those different things. And so that's one of the way we are innovating um, is through the controls of environmentally um, sustaining uh, the optimal conditions in barns. And we've done that, like I say, through integrating all the different pieces of equipment in our portfolio into a single controller that can be seamlessly managed. And that's just the kind of tactical level. As we go from there, it's really about the data that we're gaining from um, these automated pieces of equipment and, and how we can utilize that data to help farmers make better decisions and be more efficient and grow more food with less resources. Thank you. Just to follow up, is, is labor an issue for you know, a production agriculture from your perspective, and does this technology help address that shortage? So, uh, as I know Angela will say, in, uh, she's learned in all of her interviews, labor is a huge industry or issue across all industries in ag, but definitely in animal agriculture. It's one of the uh, number one issues facing the industry today. So the more automation um, that can be employed within these barns will help with the labor issue, but also with the biosecurity issue the uh, health and wellness of the animals can be improved if there are less people going in and out of that barn. So it's something uh, that we hear a lot from growers. Angela, would you like to comment on that? Please, thank you. Yeah, cued us up nicely. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I've really been appreciating today hearing the other uh, panels before us. It's sort of affirming some of the things that we've experienced and, uh, and some of the things that I've found. You know, again, I, I'm wearing a different hat than I normally wear. I'm normally in the, in the academic setting, working with students, and that's where I'm really comfortable. So this whole process has put me in a, in a new space of really uh, understanding more of the implications. And so thinking in terms of some of the things that Lena has brought up in terms of the tools that exist uh, are, are there to help our producers and our approach with our startup company is to take and add value on top of a lot of the tools that already exist. So as I was listening to sort of the um, uh, conversation about disruption in the prior panel, uh, it's something that we in our startup have really uh, spent a lot of time trying to figure out how do we approach our entry into this marketplace uh, because we are thinking about how do we apply disruption principles in a way that's going to be palatable to our clients. Um, and so we have a lot of great ideas, but we wanna make sure that they're usable and implementable. Uh, and so we're thinking about package them in a way that is super easy to use and is uh, uh, incremental disruption. I don't know if that's even a thing, but uh, it's kind of what we're thinking. Slow disruption as opposed to uh, turning over the market and creating un uncertainty, which is risk, which our producers in all of ag are tend to be less risk tolerant and less willing to adopt technology. So we're really focused on how do we package it in a way that's palatable? How do we add decision support using all of this information that is out there in ways that are uh, tangible in, in increments? So I don't know if that's a thing, but that's where we are with Telltale. So, so just I want to keep picking on you here for sure. a second because I, I mean you obviously have your, your technology that you're, you're working on. But I think there would be a lot of people in the audience that would be interested in how you as a, as a you know, associate professor, you know, in your department, um, what were the obstacles, what, what uh, gave you the courage, I guess, to kind of take the next step and, and, and develop a company? Great, um, thanks, I'm happy happy to talk about myself. I'm much more comfortable <laughs> uh, with that. So um, I uh, was promoted and tenured a few years ago and took a little bit of time to just breathe and uh, think about what do I want my career to look like 10 years from now. And I felt like I had done really cool stuff in the lab and I was really proud of my students and where they had gone. Um, but I also wanted to see impact. And so I was thinking 10 years from now, I've been doing this for 10 years already. And most of what I have done is awesome in the lab, but I don't see it in the field. Uh, I don't see it accessible to the people who I really want to be impacting. Uh, so I went down a path of exploring different opportunities for how can I get some of this uh, in, into uh, a, 
uh, production agriculture. So I work in animal welfare. I'm really passionate about welfare of animals. And in many split times, that creates kind of contentious. Welfare is often at odds with the rest of industry, but I don't think it has to be. Um, so that was the start of that process. And uh, a few nudges from some really, really um, valued people in my life uh, led me to the people I'm partnering with in the startup company. And I am the only person on my team who has an ag animal background. I'm the only person who brings that perspective, but I'm partnered with a team of people that have uh, expertise in various areas. So uh, my primary partner has um, worked with building up a software company and has, you know, leading me, uh, I feel blindly, but leading me to understand how do you monetize and how do you build a company that is um, uh, sustainable uh, and can actually have some roots and foundation and, you know, has saved me from a thousand mistakes, I'm sure. Um, and then also paired with people who have experience in other areas. So um, we're, we also have focused on thinking, what do we want our company to look like outside of solving problems? Uh, and one of our, our key um, uh, approaches is that we're a relationship company. So we're really about building relationships and trusting in those relationships and partnerships, uh, both within our company. So we joke with people that if you want to partner with us, the first hurdle is to have dinner at my house with my family. Um, and uh, that actually so far has been true. Every person that we have developed a formal partnership with has come to our house and had dinner with our family. Um, so that's part of our strategy for who we are as a company as well. Uh, does that answer most of your question? Yeah, yeah, I'll keep talking you. if you want. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll go down to the end of the panel here to Ryan. And I'd like to just ask a question about ADM and where ADM sees the opportunities. What's the big opportunity? What's the Where's the need for innovation mm -hmm. to move that into fruition? I guess. Yeah. No, that's a it's a great question, and and we're dealing with it daily. So I'll, I'll break it out into different opportunity spaces. The first, on a global basis, it our producers are they're starving for protein, right? So depending on where you're at in the globe, if you're using a fish meal source where fish meal is a near perfect ingredient for poultry for nursery swine, for aquaculture species, and you don't have access to quality proteins, your next best protein source could be a soybean meal at 48 to 52 percent crude protein. Now, as you know, having that protein source, you can use up to so much for the amino acids, but then it, it can cause acute necrotic enteritis. So there's only so much soybean that we can put in the ration. So the farmers are usually, they, they have to use fish meal and other sources to provide the, the nutrients. So we do spend a lot of time on, you know, uh, developing new protein source, quality protein source, and then using our distribution models to make sure that we can deliver those quality proteins. Um, again, I, I, protein is one of the main limiting, um, you know, sources of nutrition for those amino acids. So we do spend a lot of time there. But if we dive in deeper, another opportunity space is, as many of you know, fish meal is not, uh, it's not a sustainable resource if it's over harvested. So again, fish meal being a near perfect ingredient, you can provide those amino acids in the right balance, but there's other components in fish meal that need to be identified, you know, along with the long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids like EPA and DHA. So we're looking at that to make sure that the solutions that we have are sustainable. There's really no one-to-one -one replacement on a quality protein like fish meal. Usually have to build the components together. So what we've been doing is we've been identifying the nutrients that matter, and then either through biotechnology or through our separations capability, we have been working with, you know, with our customers on a global basis to supply those nutrients. So Ryan, how does an idea move um, through ADM? So if, uh, and, and what's the role of, of uh, interaction with um, faculty, staff, students at a university like this? Yeah, so uh, the one thing I, I really do enjoy working with ADM because I, I moved from another egg giant to this company and the philosophy at ADM, it doesn't have to be created here. Like some companies, they really believe that, you know, all of their innovation has to be in-house. But that's not how ADM works at all. I mean, we're meeting with, with businesses like yourself almost on a daily basis to understand 
what is the technology that's out there? You know, where are we at in terms of the, de in terms of the development? Can we leverage our strategic partners to help your business? I mean, managing biotechnology, I, I mean, if you're really interested, we can talk about the recent advancements in synthetic biology and the high throughput automation. So your ideas, we can work with other, with other entities and we can accelerate that product development. So again, we don't have to create it in-house. We license a lot of different technologies. We have a ventures group. It's a small incubator that we're working with people because ADM wants to make sure that we have access to the technology. And we do understand, we like to plant trees. Uh, we've been in the business a long time and trees are the innovation. We do have the patience for seven to 10 year projects. It's, it's not, um, I mean, it's a concern if you have an unbalanced portfolio, but we do have a balanced portfolio of short and extremely long-term projects. Okay, thank you. I'd like to ask Bruce uh, a similar question, you know, kind of from Elanco's perspective now, um, in terms of like um, um, technology acquisition, you know, versus development from within. Yeah, sure. It's a great question, and and um, you know, hopefully Elanco is um, is dedicated to external innovation since that's a, it's on my business card. Um, but yeah, we we probably do something around um, uh, thirty to fifty percent of uh, programs that come into the company uh, uh, originate somewhere in the um, external source. Uh, they might be a research collaboration with a university lab. Uh, they might be from a university spin-out, they might be from a biotech company, uh, they might be uh, a collaboration with a human pharma company uh, to do some translational research over. Um, and uh, oftentimes they come, they come into our own research group. We heard uh, earlier today about uh, the fact that uh, some things need to be de-risked uh, unless somebody's working very specifically on solving an animal health problem they might not be doing the, uh, the proper set of experiments. Um, you know, not everybody puts their jack inhibitor into a dog to see how it works or, or what have you. Um, so um, oftentimes they, they come slotted in in the appropriate place in the, in the pipeline, if you were. Um, so very similar to ADM, we, we take short and long-term and medium-term views of of science and, and we try to get it in there and balance out the, prof the portfolio. So, so how does one approach Elanco with an idea and what gets you excited knowing that it could be a long road to FDA approval? Yeah, um, so the, the, the first, first part of the question is, uh, is easy to answer. Uh, me um, uh, and my team, um, there are a team of six people um, who handle the external stuff. So. Um, people can come directly to me. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn or grab a business card. Um, uh, and we also have a, a email portal, uh, external innovation at Um So it's easy to get the, the ideas in and we'll, uh, we'll have a conversation about it, right? And we'll let you, and one of the things that we're committed to is letting you know, uh, if no, why no, right? Um, uh, if yes, that's e easy, um, right? But if no, why no? Um, and we find that a lot of uh, uh, folks are, uh, appreciate that, right, is, you know, what, what our th thought process is around that. Um, you know, how, how do we deal, well, um, the, there is, it is a long road. It, this is drug development, right? So um, we, you know, we basically put that together as a, as a research project and, and um, we hope that we'll have a, a very good collaboration with the uh, innovator uh, to help us in that journey. If not, if they want, if they want to uh, license and exit out, that that's okay too. Um, we just take that in, in, into consideration, right? And and all of that ends up being being cost uh, uh, th that we consider as well. So um, you know, we just we just put that together. We're um, we're pretty familiar with the process as long as it fits within a a, a kind of a known path. Uh, if it's something really disruptive. And innovative, well, that's fun too, right? We get to try to figure out what the path is, uh, and and uh, in you know, as more and more biotech comes into this space and is trying to be disruptive, what we find is we have some very interesting conversation with the regulators, right? Because it's stuff that they're not used to seeing. Um, so, but that's okay. We like that space. So, so a different kind of question going to Lena, 
who um, is, of course, site director of the AGCO GSI operations at the research park. I'm, I'm curious to know, really, how that's worked for you. I mean, you've been there, what, a year plus, and um, I see a lot of students ar around your environment there. What's, what's working and what, what has been a surprise? Um, I guess what wasn't a surprise was the quality of students. The University of Illinois, that's been highlighted many times today, has a breadth of expertise in many different colleges here, from um, the College of Engineering to the Agriculture College. Uh, there's just certainly not a shortage of bright students that are ready and excited to tackle problems. For us specifically, it's been a really interesting year and a half journey. Um, we didn't want to limit ourselves to focusing on one thing to begin with. So we started out going in 12 directions and happily say we might be going six still, but we're kind of narrowing in our focus um, and also bringing in broader perspectives from AGCO's corporate uh, business units, which is really helping to garner some more support and ideation for what our site will turn into. Um, it's been interesting to learn about people like Angela, which we want there to be more of when you have the academic uh, research-focused background that truly is relevant to our business and uh, someone that's really hopeful in trying to come up with a commercialized solution that could potentially be integrated um, into future products within a broader organization. So those are exciting things for us. Research Park in general is a uh, wonderful community of companies a very unique ecosystem where you find a lot of different companies which some days may feel like competitors, but in Research Park, uh, we're really all colleagues trying to really accomplish the same things and that's further our industries in technology and innovation and help to spread that back to our corporate organizations. So, so I've got a couple more questions, but I do encourage um, the audience to please step up to the microphone um, and ask your questions. Um, and while you're formulating that question and moving to the microphone, I'll ask another one. And I'm going to t put this um, to Ryan. And, and this has to do with like disruptive technology. And you know, this is the animal health and nutrition panel. And yet, you know, we, we read a lot today about uh, you know plant-based protein um, you know sources, mm -hmm. um, cultured meat. Mm -hmm. What what's ADM's perspective here? And what is it? Is it likely to be the disruptive technology that we think it, people think it is? Uh, that's a very uh, that's a very interesting question. So, it, it from the beginning, ADM has like over forty percent of the products we make it touches an animal, right? We're nourishing animals, but when when you look at the food side of the business, ADM has been displacing meat products uh, for decades. Right, um, there are different programs in the Midwest that that have been involved in that, and then as you move away from the United States, the need to extend meat products becomes even more important. We have seminars with uh, our colleagues throughout the Americas where they're coming in and they're learning how to better utilize grain and oil seeds to extend meat because they just they just don't have the luxury of what, what we have here in the States. So we do have a lot of expertise in the space already. But then when we look at culture meats and, you know, you get into biotechnology where you can hear about, you know, different products from ranging that's going into nutraceuticals like collagen all the way into different proteins like milk proteins, etc. I mean, that's a really interesting biotechnology space for niche applications. Uh, I do follow the Impossible Burger a lot. It, it, it is interesting. It, it's taking that extension to the full uh, extreme. Um, there are a lot of concerns. Now, okay, now this is from a, a biotech standpoint. You know, anytime that you're managing a fermentation, you have risk of coming contaminated, right? So when, when you look at these culture meats, et cetera, there is a long row for them to hoe in terms of of making sure that's a sustainable business proposition. It's interesting from a biotech you know, standpoint, but the question is, and this is more a strategic marketing question, is it ever gonna go from niche to mainstream? I mean, to displace the amount of animal proteins that's consumed on a global basis, you know, the, the, again, the question is, is it gonna remain niche or is, will it go into mainstream application? Um, 
again, ADM is looking at needs of all customers. It's, it's interesting with the milk proteins that are coming available for those that are lactose intolerant. But when you look at those operations, they're not displacing milk. They have one specific protein. And that one specific protein has an application. But again, will that technology go mainstream or stay niche? I, I think the verdict is still out. I think just to add on to that, uh, at our lab here at Research Park, we've actually done an extensive amount of market research on this topic of, uh, we call it meatless meat, cultured meat, whatever you want to call it. There's many names, um, which is all still up for debate. But um, I think, kind of to piggyback off what Ryan said, it's, it's tough to see where the industry is going to go. It's definitely there and making itself known. And it's something that even as a manufacturer of equipment, we're cognizant of because it could potentially impact, you know, the buyers of our equipment, the growers. But I think to go back to some of the statistics you provided in the beginning, Rod, I mean, if there's only a third of the population that is food secure, I think the two thirds that are not food secure are uh, just more concerned about getting their hands on whatever protein they can. And so I just think it's going to be more of the privileged eaters, if you will, that are, I guess, more privy to this sort of technology. But it will be interesting to see where it goes from here. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add, um, from, from the biotech uh, lens, uh, to me it seems like all we're doing is shifting um, the resource issues around. You know, people are concerned about land use, it's concerned about water, a uh, variety of concerns around animals uh, as a protein source, but you're, all you're gonna do is shift it to, to another, another issue. You, you, as a um, colleague said, you know, we're, you're culturing and fermenting, so you're probably gonna need antibiotics or something like that to, to, keep, to keep them clean. Uh, so now, now you're not reducing antibiotics, you're increasing antibiotics, and, and where is that gonna go? Is that, you know, how are you gonna get rid of those antibiotics? Um, so, so I think it, it's a situation where it, it's a noble cause, and it could run uh, me out of a job, but I'm, I'm concerned that all we're doing is, uh, it's like a giant balloon, right? Is we're, we're just pushing on one side of the balloon, it's just going to cause the air to move someplace else. So I think it's just shifting problems elsewhere. And Angela, maybe you can comment on um, animal welfare and, you know, the industry's role and in, in, in making sure that... Um, the public is comfortable with the way animal protein is produced. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I appreciate the perspectives of, of the rest of the panel on this one. And, you know, I can put on my university hat for a minute. I think I can just wear multiple hats today. Um, and with, from, the, from the university standpoint, or from the academic standpoint, I, I teach some of this in my classes. And among my students, I watch this uh, discussion unfold. And there's a lot of discussion about alternative proteins and where it comes from. And there's also a lot of misinformation about some of the pressures that you're discussing. So I think as that technology unfolds and those um, uh, pieces of, of the pressures either find solutions or become more aware uh, amongst uh, the consumers, then we'll see uh, that conversation continue uh, and we'll see I guess what I would consider parallel, so a lot of the animal welfare concerns that are out there for uh, the uh, concerns for animals and how they're raised and what their uh, quality of life is like in, in our production systems uh, will be paralleled by what are some of the pressures on the non-animal systems. So while we may be able to alleviate some of the, the potential for suffering and that sort of thing in our animal uh, systems, we will create other pressures uh, that may also be of concern to our consumers. So I, I will predict, I'll put a prediction out there, that we'll see diversity. And that's not a bad thing. Diversity in our food system is not a bad thing. Uh, as we think about where our food will come from in the future, having multiple ways of doing things is good because if one system experiences a failure, we have backups for how we can get our food. So it's, it's actually a good thing to have that diversity, my opinion. And, and Bruce, maybe you can comment on um, some of the gene editing technology that could make its way into, you know, the animals and what, yeah. what the hurdles are there. Can make or are making their way into to the animals, right? Uh, we have a, uh, a gene-edited uh, PERS-resistant uh, pig now. Um, so, yeah, it's a really interesting um, uh, phenomenon, and, uh, and um, as a molecular biologist, I'm, I'm thrilled by it. Um, and where it goes from a, um, 
uh, in the industry uh, will see, right? We'll see what the, what the agencies do in terms of are those genetically modified organisms, uh, you know, where the boundaries are. They, they, uh, they put a stake in the sand, but it turns, to be, uh, turns out to be quicksand, so the stake keeps moving. Um, so, um, but I, I, you know, it's one thing to think about your production animal being, being your genetically modified organism, but I think you also have uh, the routes of, of the, the, the uh, plants that they're, they're eating uh, or microorganisms that, that we're giving. So the other place to, to be looking at is, is, is editing um, probiotics to, to have um, positive effects, whether it's positive effects from a nutrition side or it's positive effect as a, as a treatment uh, to reduce necrotic enteritis, for example, or something like that. Um, so I, I think it's a wide open space and I'm really looking forward to it uh, as a biotechnologist to, to watch it develop and, and see how we can, can continue to apply it. Questions from the audience? They usually tell you if you just wait long enough, somebody will ask you a question. Oh, there it is. Yeah. I have one question. I'm Induru Pasara from Fruit Vaccine Incorporated, a research park company, uh, developing vaccines for globally problematic diseases, ta mainly targeting humans, but now um, listening to Bruce, like it's very interesting. We are actually um, looking into, looking into hum uh, animal vaccines as well. So how do you see like uh, this GMO issue coming because like we are developing a vaccine in a fruit. So that involves genetic modification, gene editing kind of technology. Uh, we see that as, the, as a promise, like it's very natural. We are introducing just one gene of this virus which triggers immunity. Um, so uh, this belief of seeing GMO, the three letters GMO as a devil, how can we make uh, that into a an angel kind of view? Uh, it, it's a fantastic question and I wish I had the, the answer. Uh, we've been struggling with that for, for a long time. Uh, it's public perception, right? Uh, so I'm gonna say that it's the faculty at the University of Illinois' problem um, to solve for us, right? We need to, we need to educate the, the population to, to stop seeing science as such a monster um, and go back to seeing it as a, as a solution, right? Um, I mean, some of these questions of, of how are we going to feed people, right? Um, uh, so, uh, specifically, you know, there, there are some elements of genetically modified transgenic animals, which is okay from a regulatory perspective. Some is not. Uh, um, and so one of the big, one, big watch outs uh, on our side is anything that has antibiotic resistance in there, so if you're using an antibiotic resistance marker to, to carry through, right, uh, you know, that's, that, that would be problematic. Um, and those have to be, they, those have to be chased out. Um, so, uh, but I think the bigger, the big global picture of, of how, we have to change the perception, right? So we need to go knock on heads until they understand that science is a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, we might say war is a bad thing, not a good thing, right? We could maybe change some of the dynamics here, right? Um, so uh, now that's my personal point of view. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, I better stop. <clears throat> so. so quick question to, to Lena. Um, what, what's the message um, from Agco GSI to your customers um, that are involved directly in, in animal production at a time when the markets are, you know, not very good, and how does that affect the way Agco GSI approaches um, product development? So we really want to take a grassroots approach to product development. As a manufacturer of equipment, our primary focus is truly on helping the growers. 
Um, they're the main users of our equipment, and their success ultimately leads to our success. So the more we can do to benefit them and be successful, it really starts uh, from the bottom with just listening to them, getting on farms, and not just sitting in your office coming up with your own ideas. You have to understand your customer at its core, and even just watching how they interact with equipment in their barn, whether it's ours or a competitor's, but really understanding what their pain points are. So I guess our core message to our customers is that we're here to be your partner in business and we want to help you be successful. Uh, one of the things I talk a lot with our student interns in Research Park, which truthfully majority have zero ag background, so there's a foundational level of knowledge that I typically have to bestow upon them uh, right out the gate, but it's that Animals uh, who are unhappy will not grow and thrive the way happy, comfortable animals will. So on the most basic level for even interns we employ that have concerns about animal welfare and how um, our food production is raised today, it's just the pure concept of if an animal is happy, they're going to eat more, sleep more, drink more, and which is going to help them grow faster. If they are not enjoying the environment they're in, they're hot, they're cramped, they're hungry, they're not going to grow as well. So it's really in the farmer's best interest to provide the animals with the best quality of life that they can while they're in their care. And that's something we really also take into consideration in the design of our products is that animal welfare piece and how can we help the animals be comfortable and more productive. Question for Ryan and, and Bruce. Um, we've, we've been talking about um, production of animal protein. What about the, the companion animal space and, and where do you see the need for innovation there? We'll start with Ryan. Great question. So in, in companion animal ADM, we participate in three spaces. One is the, the development of ingredients to support the, the industry. Two, pet treats. Uh, and then with the recent acquisition of Neovia, we, we have the full chain with pet foods not in the United States, uh, but in other geographies. Uh, there's a lot of interest in many geographies in humanizing the pet. So whatever I eat and feed my family, I believe that's uh, also good for my pet. And they're moving away from ingredients we know how to use really well, like soy, corn, and wheat. So um, in our procurement strategies, we're looking at ancient grains, legumes, et cetera, because we still have to provide the nutrition and hit the targeted functions, whatever it is in, in, the, in the need. But it, 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 it's challenging because those ingredients really haven't been studied. Um, with the digestibility, what can it do? I mean, the last thing that you want if you're in an apartment on the 34th floor is an animal that has stool issues. So. We spend a lot of time uh, understanding, you know, the fate and flow. We have a great collaboration with the staff here in Illinois just to make sure that we were delivering those solutions to companion animals. Um, you know, along with that digestive health, as we move away, uh, there's also interest in other applications, the oral care, uh, you know, the, the coat quality, overall hygiene. Uh, but again, when, when you're moving away from the nutrition of known ingredients to new, it poses uh, significant challenges. And again, as a pet owner, you do not want to have challenges with your animal. Um, they're, they're usually not the best experience for you. Yeah, I got to agree with you, Ryan. Even, even on a first floor apartment, you don't want a, a dog with diarrhea. Um, you know, one of the one of the issues is we, we've had great advances in, in, in animal nutrition, on, especially on the companion animal side, uh, but we've also seen some unintended consequences, right? Some recent uh, uh, cardiac events um, with specialty food, pet foods, and and so we have to be careful also uh, to you know it's a, this is a bit of a science, right? Uh, pharmaceuticals is a science. Well, so is uh, so is food, right? Um, but yeah, so innovation needs in companion animals besides nutrition to keep them healthy, uh, we have helped our animals live a very long life, right? The age just keeps increasing by, you know, 10, 10, 15 percent. Uh, and so that means they start looking like me. They start getting old and they get slow and they get pain. And, and so we need innovations in all this space. So you're looking at, at great, from a, 
from a money perspective, great growth markets in pain management, uh, atopic dermatitis, uh, diabetes, obesity, um, and of course you still have flea and ticks, right? Hey, great news for the pharmaceutical industry, fleas and ticks start becoming resistant to the, to the uh, chemicals we're putting out there, so we need, we need more. That includes heartworm, right? So, um, so there's still lots of room for innovation. We're keeping them around longer. Also great for the economics. Usually we churn two or three uh, in our adult lifetime. So we, we get to keep digging into that wallet to, to keep those animals uh, healthy and, and treated. So lots and lots of room for innovation. We're tapping into every resource we possibly can. The human pharma companies, the biotech companies, uh, stand in as tall as we can on the shoulders of giants, right? Um, and, and one of the things that, that I would pose to, to people who are really entrepreneurially thinking is you'll hear both on the food animal and companion animal side is, oh, it's too expensive to put an antibody in, in a cow or a pig. Solve the problem. Find a way for me to deliver an antibody or other large molecule like that that is cost effective so that we can now leap forward ahead of uh, human biotech, right? Um, and so there's a good chance if you can make that really cheap, then all of a sudden your $100,000 a year uh, antibody treatments on the human side would come down as well, so, right? So, so we have to think really entrepreneurial about some of those problems so we can tap into all the technology. Yeah, so I, I mean, you know, Brent, Br uh, Bruce stimulated some thought for me. The, the other thing is about 10 years ago, we were spending millions of dollars in mo modulating gut microbiota, but the challenge was we didn't have clear markers. Right, so we were looking at, you know, different populations of gut microbiota to see what effects we can have. Fast forward today, we do have models that exist, high throughput screening, you know, leveraging these models with very specific biomarkers for companion animals, very close to what we're doing in human nutrition. We have models to identify inflammation, right? Inflammation is one of the number one things that we're trying to reduce. Uh, in companion animals when they get the achy joints. You can, we have different obesity models. If everyone would just feed a quarter cup of food, you know, to your animal a day, everything would be fine, but we, we like that indulgence, right? We like to feed our pets. So there's different models that we can look to make sure they're getting the right adequate amount of nutrition, but then, you know, we can keep the weight off the animals because again, if you have overweight animals, they're gonna get inflammation, et cetera. So the exciting thing is, is when we invest together in this space, there are more practical models for us to use to really get into you know, compelling science and have offerings to, to that space. Okay, so just to wrap things up here, I'm just gonna start with Bruce, we'll go down the panel, 30 seconds or less. If someone in the audience has, has an idea that um, perhaps connects to your company, what, what advice do you give them? I, I think we heard a lot of it in the, in the venture side, right, is, is you know, get a clarity around that, that technology uh, so it's easier for, for us to understand. We're going to do the uh, same kind of process that the ag companies uh, do um, to uh, um, uh, run it through our organization to see uh, the good fit. So, so you want it to be organized and, and you just have to be patient with a larger company's uh, approach. Good, and you know, in our customer discovery process, the uh, main messaging we heard was, uh, if you're gonna make it, make it work. And if you are going to make it, it needs to solve more problems than it creates. So that's, that's we're going with it. I think my advice would be to make sure you've done your market research on the industry and that you know who you're targeting uh, with your product or idea, but also, Definitely do your market research on the company that you're approaching. Know what their position in the market is and make sure that you understand how you can potentially be a beneficial partner to them and vice versa. And if you are in the audience today and have an idea or a product that would be applicable to our business, I'm in Champaign and feel free to reach out. Yeah, I just want to build on that comment. Uh, for those of you interested in the space, try to interact with as many people that are producers just to get the perspective and understand what the needs are. I mean, the better you ground yourself after the market research and, and get some of those testimonials, I think you'll better position your business, really, and then you can articulate it to those entities you're interested in partnering with, right? You don't wanna, 
you don't want to pitch your project to um, one of the large companies that by default it will be scrutinizing your business. You want to make sure that you understand the needs and how it will be beneficial. And the best way you can do that is to interact with the, with the producers that are raising the animals. Okay, so that concludes our morning session. So please uh, join me in thanking our panelists.